There once was a teaching, held sacred and secret, and preserved only for the worthy. This teaching was not written in a book. It was written in the sky, and it dealt with man's fate after mortal life. When the soul left the body, it had to journey on a great and terrible road. It would first arrive at a garden inhabited by widows who bathed in light. This garden was thought to exist within the stars known today as Cassiopeia. Next, the deceased crossed a great ravine watched by fierce ravens who picked out the eyes of the dead, who in turn had to replace their eyes with sacred poppies. This ravine was seen amongst the stars of Cephas and Lacerta. Even a greater trial awaited, overseen by a thundering deity known as Scorpion Woman and discerned within the stars of sickness. If the dead could pass these terrible adversaries, they then traveled a thin and narrow road across an impassable sea, seen as the Cygnus Rift in the Milky Way. Overcoming all obstacles, the soul officially entered the land of the dead, which lay past the stars of present-day Aquila. The philosophy behind this teaching dealt with the ultimate fate and eternal life of man. Humankind, accordingly, descended from the star world. All things on earth also came from the star world. More importantly, certain stars in the sky were the repositories of the true forms from which earthly things were made. As above, so below. Earth was a heavenly reflection. So too was man. The human soul was the greatest emanation of heavenly powers, not in might or dominion, but in conscience and infinite potential. All things were sublime, and to live in harmony and peace was to treat every living thing on earth accordingly. This teaching did not come from the high civilizations of Egypt, or Mesopotamia, or from ancient Rome. It came from a tribal culture known as the Chumash Indians. These Native Americans dwelt in what is now Southern California. Most of their culture has faded like a dream. Now only fragments remain, such as their star maps painted on cave ceilings. These too are flaking away, being overwritten by time, or worse, graffiti. The Heavenly Myths of the Chumash did more than give an initiate directions through the next world. These myths also served political, astrological, medicinal, and weather-controlling purposes. They revealed to the Chumash ultimate reality and taught them the true nature of the immortal and immeasurable self. The Lakota were the indigenous peoples of the Great Plains in North America. By the 18th century, the Sioux tribe had migrated mostly within the area now known as North and South Dakota. The Sioux were skilled hunters, but also grew crops. As the new season of spring approached, the Sioux made camp in the Black Hills. This was their camp established for the arrival of the spring equinox and the land itself was thought to be a replica of the Lakota constellation Dried Willow, made out of the stars we know as Aries and Triangulum. As the sun moved counterclockwise, it entered another Lakota constellation known as the Seven Little Girls, or the modern Pleiades. The Sioux would break camp and migrate to another place in the Black Hills, thought to be an earthly replica of those stars. As the sun reached summer solstice, the Sioux would arrive at a great mountain, today known as Devil's Tower. But to the Sioux, it was the place where a pack of mighty bears had scraped their claws against the mountain, and where their great ancestor, named Fallen Star, had raised a brother and sister into the heavens. The mountain itself was the earthly replica of the Lakota constellation Bear Lodge, modeled amongst the stars including the modern Castor and Pollux. The Sioux's migration was not a random, nomadic trail pressed out by following herds. The Sioux followed the entrance of the sun 
in their most sacred constellations to corresponding sites on the ground, which were imagined as the mirror image of those stars. In the words of one scholar, quote, from being at the right places at the right times and doing the appropriate ceremonies, the people receive spiritual power from Wakan Wasti, the cosmic powers of good. This stellar power was especially focused through the sun to certain sites on earth as it passed through the constellations correlated with those sites. Ronald Goodman sums up the whole situation. Reflecting on what has been delineated so far, the stars were the visible scriptures of the people at night, and the related landforms were the visible scriptures during the day. Both night and day, the people walked between sacred stories written in the sky and on earth, which, through the mediation of fallen star, taught them how to establish an authentic relation to the sky, Skan, the one who moves whatever moves. For the Lakota, spiritual power was achieved by living in harmony with the stellar macrocosm. The entire spring journey was a ceremony which attempted to mirror on earth what was happening in the spirit world. Lakota star knowledge, together with the oral tradition, was a ritual artifact of attunement. The nomadic life of the Lakota can be fully understood only in the context of their stellar theology. In the fall of 1942, a Navajo medicine man named Jeff King decided to reveal the myth where the two came to their father, to a Western anthropologist who had worked amongst the Navajo for her entire career. He lamented that when he died, the myth would die with him, for no one knew of the old ways. The myth originally was ritually performed amongst Navajo warriors before a raiding party or military action. To reveal the myth, the medicine man began by creating sand paintings, sacred depictions made of colored pollens and cornmeal laid out on buckskin. The paintings mirror mythic events used in Navajo rituals reflecting the secret cosmology of the Navajo tribe. The medicine man then gave a holy blessing upon the paintings and the anthropologist which she recorded. I am changing woman's son. I am changing woman's son. Eastern mountain, chief of all mountains, I walk with your feet. I walk with your legs. I walk with your body and with your mind and with your sound. O oh, mountain of the east, I am the one that lives on forever. Everything is beautiful. Everything is beautiful. Out of my mouth beauty and around me beauty. I an everlasting man. The myth was a ritual endowment. The medicine man began with the Navajo creation story. The origins of sky, earth, and stars were told, of the first people and of a flood. Certain stars were identified as the source of wisdom. Most importantly, participants understood that their ancestors came from the star world and their true heritage descends from the eternal realm. Changing Woman's Son is the title for the initiate who was born of Mother Earth in her miraculous transition in spring when all things old are born anew. In Where the Two Came to Their Father, Changing Woman has two sons, Monster Slayer and Child Born of Water. Both these sons ascend to the sky world to find their true father. In order to do this, they must reach the end of the world guarded by Sand Dune Boy. The heroes can only pass him by using songs. Surpassing the edge of the world, the heroes enter the zone beyond mortality, where death becomes rebirth. The road through this veil is so perilous the heroes need a guide. 
Spider Woman comes to their aid, giving them secret knowledge for their journey. They must surpass the proper entrance to the next world called Rock That Claps Together, a dangerous portal that cuts in pieces those who are not worthy. The heroes come to a vast and insurmountable sea. With the help of Spider Woman, they cross the heavenly waters on four mountains, each bearing trials of their own. They finally arrive at the House of the Sun, where their eternal father dwells. They are given new identities as Father Son declares, quote, I will give you my wisdom before you go down. You must always use it and hand it down so that my wisdom will always be on earth." End quote. So it is that the heroes return to the mortal world with the experience and knowledge of everlasting man. The end of their journey is summarized by the final sand painting of the myth as described by Joseph Campbell. The picture of Sky Father and Earth Mother, surrounded by the horizon of the sacred colors, eternally enwrapped in the world engendering embrace. This is a picture of the soul, because mythologically speaking, the microcosm is a precise reproduction of the macrocosm. Like the Lakota, parts of this myth were associated with specific points on the landscape. Sand Dune Boy was associated with the sand and rock dunes at the edge of Navajo land. Spider Woman was seen as a great rock formation. Various mountains in the myth corresponded with mountains on the terrain. While all the names and costumes are strange to Western ears, the motifs in the myth are no different than is found in the grand celestial landscape of the old world religions. In order for the Navajo heroes to journey into the next realm, they had to pass Sand Dune Boy by singing songs. One is reminded that Orpheus can only pass Cerberus with his music and hymns. Addis passes to the next world by performing songs and dances for its guardian. The Egyptian dead must pass a care and obtain the Nemi's crown whilst performing choral hymns. The proper entrance to the next world was rock that claps together. This motif has an exact parallel in the Greek simple gades, or clashing rocks, which were said to be the entrance to the underworld. The heroes require a guide, Spider Woman, just as Anubis led the Egyptian dead through the astral world, or as the Anuna led Gilgamesh to the underworld. Orpheus and Dionysus are also guides of the secret way that runs between the worlds. Finally, the heroes come to an impassable sea, a universal theme in underworld mythology. Again, the myth sounds like a retelling of the Babylonian story of the hero twins Gilgamesh and Enkidu, or even the Greek Heracles and Iphicles. The twin heroes represent the twin aspects of nature, male and female, the heavenly and underworld realms, light and dark, immortal and mortal. There are many variations of these dual heroes throughout myth, including Castor and Pollux, Prometheus and Epimetheus, Romulus and Remus, Jacob and Esau, Hunapu and Shubalenki, and the list goes on. What is missed in many of these discussions, however, is the astral themes involved. Like the Chumash directions through the sky, where the two came to their father is a set of directions, leading the soul through the perils of the next world to find eternal life in the star world. This war ceremonial appears to have done more than prepare the Navajo warriors psychologically for battle. For in enacting this myth, every warrior took upon themselves the persona of the hero twins, monster slayer and child born with water. But this ceremony did more than that. It gave every warrior an individual path into the beyond. Like the Orphic gold plates or the Egyptian Book of the Dead, found buried with the initiated dead, where the two came to their father, served to underwrite the true nature of oneself and one's destiny. Linked with certain stars in the sky and land features on the ground, and performed in sacred ritual, the myth presented the individual with his true identity everlasting man. So this secret teaching dealt 
with ultimate beginnings and ultimate ends. It could be remembered and read throughout the year as the stars of the true and noble path circled above. One remembered one's true nature and the true nature of all things around him by watching certain stars rise above the horizon during the seasonal cycle. As they rose and set, so too did the life of man, and they pointed towards a way, a secret way to divine destiny, where the souls of all the living would ascend upwards and outwards, away from all earthly things, where it would journey with the firmament of the moon and all the planets and join with the sun and step out into an eternal deep of stars to a river of milky light where all the good dwelt and where one could at last rest forever in the fields of the grandfathers. Ciao. 